take a look at the eyes of this dog. I guess what you might see is joy, expectation. So perhaps this dog is already waiting that he or she or it can go out with his owner and have just fun out there. So what I want to claim here in general that life is intrinsically about anticipation. And it's not only about anticipation, but it's also about how we are using our anticipation for changing our environments, for creating artifacts, for creating innovation. And that's the topic which I want to talk about here. So before doing that, we have to have a closer look actually what is happening when we are perceiving the world, when we're anticipating the world. And cognitive science and neuroscience can give us at least some insights into these processes. Think about when you're perceiving something, just the situation right here. Normally we think, okay, they're outside, there's the reality out there, and it's somehow represented in our brains and we experience it like we are experiencing it right, right now. However, if you take a closer look at neuroanatomy, at neuroscientific findings, you will find there are not only connections going from the outside world to our brains or to our visual cortex, but also the other way around. So they are so-called top-down projections. And this means, or this can be interpreted as that our brain very much functions like a prediction machine. So the main task of our brain is not basically to just passively perceive the world and think about it, but to predict the world and to make, to, to test it whether these predictions which are already there are functioning or not. So, this implies that we can only see what we already know. We can only do and make what we already know. At least as a first point. So, what does it mean for innovation? I just want to give you one example of what it means. You know, we are reproducing the same with just a little bit of variation, adaptation, optimization. That is what is called incremental innovation. So that's fine as long as the world functions in a linear manner. However, what we are experiencing today, every day, you know, in the last two, two years, especially in the last month, even more especially, it's exactly the opposite. We are experiencing a world which is completely unpredictable, more or less unpredictable. So that is what is called a VUCA world, meaning volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And that is the reason why we are experiencing that, is because the, expo the, the dynamics which the whole world is driving is highly um, exponential. And that's why we are having difficulties with our linear predictions which are coming from our brain. And we will end up in situations which we never would have thought we would end up. And that's exactly the question, how are we dealing with that in the context of innovation? And furthermore, we are not only thinking about things, we are not only perceiving things, but we want to actively transform our world. And how can we actively transform our world in a beneficial manner if we are caught in such a linear dynamics? So the question is, how do we want to shape our future? How do we want to innovate our future? And for doing that, we would have to have first a quick look what it is actually when we talk about the future. So that is not a, a, a kind of homogeneous thing. Um, and if you have a very quick look at what you see here, is there are various regions or various domains of the future. Uh, the further you go out into the future or in the time, the higher or the bigger the space of possibilities is becoming. And you can actually differentiate various regions, like the projected future, which is just the extrapolation of what you already know, or the plausible future, or the possible future, like, like this is like the, the, the knowledge which is just possible. 
actually what we are looking at or what we are looking for is not a specific domain but actually an intersection. We are looking for a preferable future, for a desirable future. So how something should be, how something would, we would like to have it happen. So the question remains, how can we innovate and how can we design for a preferable and thriving future? In other words, we are searching for an alternative understanding of innovation. And my proposition here is that we start to understand innovation as a process of co-creation of the future, but also as a process of co-creation together with the future. And in order to understand it a little bit better, I want to present you several strategies. How can we design and innovate the future? The first one is quite straightforward. Actually, it's an experience which each of you has every day. You might have an idea in your mind, yeah, as a layman, as a scientist, as a student, whatever, in any kind, any context. And normally the way how we think we innovate or how we design something or how we create something is there is the idea in our mind and it is somehow externalized via our actions. So what we are doing, the environment or the material in that case, like in pottery case, um, the clay you know, receives the form which we had in our mind. So we're creating an artifact according to our ideas. However, if we take a little bit of a closer look, you will see your things are not as easy as it seems. You know, I'm a scientist and you know that exactly, no, it's not working the way. Your hypothesis, your knowledge doesn't simply work in many cases. If you're an artist, if you're a mother, if you're a father, it doesn't matter. You know, the environment behaves differently than we expect. That's what we heard already. So, the point is, that we have to start rethinking our relationship you know, between our ways of thinking, that's the green line on the left side, and our, the material flow. And what we're getting at actually is that there is not only a one-way direction or one-way relationship, but it's an interaction. So what we see is that there is going on what we refer to as a conversation with the material. Material being any entity which we want to change, any entity we, we, which we want to transform. So the focus is on interaction and we have to acknowledge that there is a resistance coming from there and we have to adapt to that resistance. But in the end, and I think that's important, it's still us who are the designers and who, where, where, we, where we, we, and we will end up at a specific um, outcome. So, for instance, that's what we're doing when we're prototyping, we are when we're making experiments in science. That's exactly the process. However, that's not the end of the story. Because this is just about, just about, sorry, I know it sometimes is really complex, about adaptation and optimization according to ide our ideas. If we go one step further, we take this thought one step further, we have to start rethinking our relationship with the environment. We have to re start rethinking what is the role of the environment. And we start to understand, or we have to admit, that it is not possible to transmit or to inscribe all of our ideas into the matter or into the material or you know, into the material form. There always remains a difference. And that's the important point. Uh, in science, uh, this is exactly when you fail an, ex an experiment. But this is the interesting point where you say, okay, hmm. There, it's, get crea it's getting creative for the first time, really creative, but it's not me as a creator, but the environment being creative for us in interaction with us. So the environment becomes a source of novelty, actually. And that's really interesting with respect to refiguring and reinterpreting um, innovation. So, in a way, both the agent and the environment, or the material, however you want to call it, are changing and together they are joining and becoming a new unity. And that's the way how I suggest to look at innovation or at any kind of knowledge creation. 
So we are entering into the process of co-becoming, uh, of co-creation, or sometimes it's also called correspondence. There's a correspondence going on between environment and our thinking, and our existential thinking. So, in a way, we are shaping, and at the same time, we are shaped. Which can be said in that words, we are designing our world, while our world acts back on us and designs us. So, this is fine, but what about the future? So, there we have to take a little bit of a different perspective. We have to understand, as we have seen, that innovation is intrinsically about anticipating the future, but our brains are having a hard time in doing that. So how is it possible, if we take seriously the role of the environment, how is it possible to rethink innovation in that way into this future perspective? So what we have to, how we have to think about it is we have to create niches in the future and identify potentials in this future. So what is a potential? A potential is something interesting. It's a something paradoxical, actually. It is there, although it is not there. It has a kind of double life. Yeah? So it is intrinsically there, but it is not yet visible. So what we have to learn is we have to learn to deal or to identify or to sense even potentials, make some sense out of it, bringing them back, and letting guide them our way into the future. And that is what is called learning from the future as it emerges. So this is then a very nice, you know, this very nicely captures this, like this, this approach or this also this mindset, how we can deal in a future, in a real future-oriented manner. And to wrap up, let me come up with at least three final thoughts on which kinds of skills mindsets, um, yes, let's say skills and mindsets, uh, or let's say attitudes, do we need for dealing with, in the, for, 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 for coming up with innovations like that? So the first one is we have to radically open ourselves. So we have to become radically receptive to the world. And this goes very nicely with, with the vulnerability. That's exactly what, um, what we mean by that. We have to become open. We have to expose ourselves to the silence of the potentials. This is a very different skill than that what would we learn in MBAs or even in, in like our scientific ed education or wherever. This is a very different way of approaching the world. The second point is giving up control. What does it mean? It means that our brains, as we have seen, they try to keep control over our world, mentally and physically. We have to lower our mental and physical shields, and that's exactly about this giving up control. Finally, why are we doing it? Because, in the end, we want to follow the flow of an unfolding future. You know, I chose deliberately this image because it shows you exactly what you have here. It's like the potentiality of the landscape, which is so rich, which invites us. This is a kind of affordance for the designer for, for creating such a road going through here. So in the end, to sum up, when we talk about these kinds of innovation, where we want to really fut being future-oriented, we have to engage in a process of learning from the future as it emerges. Thank you very much.